You please take your Bibles, open them up to uh, Romans chapter 6. So we welcome you here today if you're uh, with us online to Calvary Baptist Church in Hollister. And um, why should you watch? Well, this is what we want to uh, hopefully encourage you today. Uh, we're in a series that we've just started on Sunday morning that we believe will help you in conforming to the image of Christ. Uh, that's God's purpose for us according to Romans chapter 8 verse 29 that we be uh, conformed to the image of His Son. Now today's specific message uh, gives you three ways um, that uh, for you to consider yourself dead unto sin and alive unto God. So Romans chapter 6 uh, verse 11 is our theme verse for the entire series. Now we're going to start there and then we're going to go all over the place as far as uh, where we'll be in the Bible today. So if you're following along at home, um, you're going to have to move quickly through the pages of the Bible. So Romans chapter 6 is where we're going to start and then uh, we'll just go from there into um, just lots of verses. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So reckoning, it means to count on something to be true. That's the definition of the word reckon, to count on something to be true. And so today we're going to be looking at the basis of reckoning part two. In other words, the very foundational part of what it means to reckon. And uh, look, last week we looked at certain things like we need to know what to reckon. And so uh, the co-identification truths to be reckoned to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God, the resurrection of Christ. And uh, so our proposition here today is to, uh, the three ways that we can reckon ourselves today is to be a word-centered Christian, a uh, Christ or cross-centered Christian, and then a Holy Spirit-centered Christian. So let's look at our first point here today in our introduction. Uh, our beautiful little frog, all right? Um, metamorphosis. So this frog uh, started out as a tadpole and turned into a frog. And when he gets kissed by the princess, he'll turn into a, a, a king, right? Um, and so that wonderful change takes place. But, you know, for us, um, we start out as that unregenerate tadpole. And God uh, changes us through salvation into that wonderful frog, all right? But one day we'll be glorified and actually be changed into the very image of His Son. So if you notice the verse up there, it is uh, from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, uh, where it uh, talks about actually chapter 3, but uh, we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into uh, the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So as we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives to show us more of Christ through the Word, we're changed into that image of Jesus. There will be less of the flesh and more of the Spirit. Less of self and more of Christ. As John the Baptist said, I must decrease but He must increase. And so we want to look more like Christ. So we, last week we looked at the basics of reckoning. Today we're going to continue on that. But uh, to reckon biblically then a Christian must be word-centered, cross-centered, and spirit-centered. And so let's look here at what it means to be a word-centered Christian. So you've got some different points up there. Uh, letter A, the Bible is our guide. So the Word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Uh, in His light, we have light. Um, Sanctify them through Thy truth, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 17. Thy word is truth. Uh, Romans 15, verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Hey, Christians are never without hope. Are you thankful for that? And the Old Testament uh, is written for our encouragement that we would have a good hope. And so tonight we're going to start a new series entitled Profiles in Faith. And we're going to look at the life of Abel and uh, be encouraged by him 
in what those Old Testament scriptures encourage us to do. So the Bible very simply is where we start. It's the touchstone for reckoning. This is where the doctrine is. The early church met daily and they met for instruction in the apostles' teaching and the doctrine that the apostles gave. So if you, uh, this year as a Christian, let's just put it this way. I hope that you'll pick up your Bible and you'll read it each day. Have some kind of a reading plan. Um, I plan personally to go through the Psalms at least twice this year. Um, I love the Psalms. They encourage me. It's where I find my worship and my spirit going up to the Lord. I just pray them back to the Lord. Uh, perhaps it's just reading one chapter out of the book of Proverbs corresponding to the date on the calendar. So today is January 3rd, read Proverbs 3. Tomorrow is 4th, read Proverbs 4. Uh, some people like to read a gospel, uh, a proverb, and a psalm, just one chapter, and uh, do that three chapters a day, and uh, that's what they do. Some people like reading through the Bible in a year, and so sometimes you can actually now use your smartphones to listen through uh, the Bible. So they have plans set up for you and uh, you just listen to it on your way to work. Use your drive time uh, to do that. And um, so I know what a commute is like up when I lived up in Contra Costa County. I would go about 15 miles one way and believe it or not it would take me an hour to do that. And so that was uh, some of my prayer time and some of my uh, word time. Um, sometimes I did it early in the morning when I was out on the walking trail and would uh, walk for about two, two and a half miles or so and just spend some time listening to the word on my phone and then praying it back to the Lord. But let the word be your guide this week. Now, this letter B here, it says the Bible is our sure experience. What do I mean by that? Well, the word has to be your guide, not your personal experiences. Christianity is very prone to experience-oriented pursuit of Christ. Um, you ever heard of a Simon the Stylite? He sat on top of a pillar for over 20 years wearing itchy clothes because he thought that that was the experience to reach Christ, to be more godly. Um, the monastics, have you heard of them? They, they, they withdraw from society and go to a monastery because they're seeking a certain experience of deliverance from sin. Um, some people are ex expecting an experience of power and um, a, a second blessing from the Lord. We don't need more experiences. We need more of the word. And I'll share with you how that translates just a moment into experience. But let it be our sure guide. Let it be our sure experience. Um, the Apostle Peter and uh, James and John had a wonderful experience. They were on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Peter uh, later wrote about that experience in his uh, general epistle. And he said this, But we have a more sure word of prophecy. So even better than his experience of seeing Christ transformed in front of his very eyes was the fact that he could actually let his eyes fall on the written word. And that was more reliable, a more sure word of prophecy for us today. And so that's the normal experience of Christians to be in the word, to touch with the word. Now this truth of the word becomes reality in us. Objective truth becomes our experience through the power of of the Holy Spirit. Have you noticed what Paul wrote to the Galatians in chapter 5? You can turn over there if you want. We're going to look at verses 19 through 22. And we'll notice the, the difference in their experience. Now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, Hatreds, variance, emulations, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the such like of which I tell you uh, before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 
And that's quite a list. Um, those are things that as Christians we don't want to experience, but verse 22 is what we do want to experience. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. There's a changed life there, isn't there? There are, there are works of the flesh, and then there's the fruit of the Spirit. Now, that's not nine separate fruits, uh, fruits plural. That's fruit singular. This is what the Holy Spirit produces in us, and that's a completely different experience. Then on uh, this, your uh, slide there, it says letter C, uh, the Bible is our life. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, when Jesus was tempted, uh, he responded to the devil three times. Uh, it is written, but this is what he says in Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Listen, we hunger after physical safety. We, we want daily food. We want daily safety. But do we want daily instruction from the Lord for our souls? And we cannot live but just by the physical aspects of life alone. One of the great overemphasis in the whole pandemic is that on the material nature of man. And the greatest underemphasized part, okay, just not being talked about, is man's spiritual need. Now, the world might call it mental health, right? But mental health is only healthy if it's enlightened with the Word of God. And so that's where we find our, our substance for life. Uh, listen to what Job said. Now, was Job going through a hard time? Uh, Job was going through a hard time. This is what he said. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of your lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job had an intimacy of fellowship where he was in the words of God. And so God's words were important to him. And then letter D, the Bible is our weapon. In the Christian life, there are very few things that we uh, use offensively to go gain ground. One of those is, is the, the boots of the gospel, right? So in 2021, put on your gospel boots and go take some ground from the devil. But here's your second offensive weapon, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Do you have a sin that gets, just keeps tripping you up? Is it lust? Is it anger? Is it bad finances? Uh, covetousness? Uh, what is the weapon that's going to defeat that in your life? The Word of God. And so God will cut away the desires of your uh, wrong affections and do a good work in you. So as you fellowship with Him in His Word... And so, reckon, count on this to be true. The Bible. The Bible is the source of your Christian growth, of your Christian life. Listen, bring your Bibles to church. Fact check the pastor. It's okay. That's being noble-minded. Make sure that the doctrine that's being taught from the pulpit matches up. Read it in your homes. Teach it. Meditate in it. Memorize it. Share it. Recite it back to yourself. But the Word of God. Secondly, we need to then reckon as a Christ-centered Christian. You can take your Bibles and go over to Galatians chapter 6, uh, verse 14. <clears throat> But reckon as a Christ-centered Christian, um, a cross-centered Christian, the cross of Christ. But Galatians 6.14 says, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. As a newborn babe, we desired hungered after the sincere milk of the word. As we grow, sometimes we lose that. That's why we started with the word. But then as we grow in our maturity, 
we learn that following Christ is following him to our cross. We died with him at his cross, but then we die to ourselves by bearing our cross. And Paul is saying, I'm not going to glory in anything but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Society, culture is not glorying in death right now. All right, we're lamenting it. We as Christians, we need to glory in not physical death, but glory in spiritual death, the death of self. So let's look here at uh, this first point. Christ is our death. Now, Paul is saying, this is what I'm going to glory in. Christ dying on the cross because I died with him. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 6, we were crucified with Christ. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. The life now that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we want to be reckoning that we died with Christ. Christ is also our death. Our death to our old nature, our old affections, our sin. And by faith we consider that to be true. You know, so many times we want to receive the benefits of the cross without actually having to carry the cross. Uh, we're looking for a way to crawl down off of the cross. But the Lord says if you suffer with him, you will also share in glory with him. We see then this principle in the scripture that death leads to life. So just as we were crucified with Christ and buried with him, we're also raised with him. Romans chapter 6 verse 4. To walk in the newness of life. Isn't that what we do when we have a baptism? Um, we, we say, you know, have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Okay, then based upon your testimony, your identifying with Christ, we now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in the likeness of his death. And I'm glad that I've never lost somebody down there, okay? But raised with him in the likeness of his resurrection to walk in the newness of life. And so death leads to life. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 says, Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. What do you need to put down? What do you need to crucify? That's not fun. That's not enjoyable. That's not something that the flesh relishes doing. But nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Death leads to life. It's okay if some of your dreams die. It's okay to be in pain. Because death leads to life. Secondly, as a Christ-centered Christian, not only is he our death, he is our pattern. As Christians who want to disciple younger Christians, and I trust that you'll make that a goal this year, to actually sit down with a younger Christian and disciple them one-on-one. -on -one. I have that joy. Uh, I do that on Friday I do that on Tuesday. I do that on Sunday. Uh, twice on Friday, and then once on Sunday, and once on Tuesday. So I'm meeting with four people, just discipling younger Christians, trying to help them grow. And uh, what? actually twice on Tuesday as well. <clears throat> and uh, so do that. Disciple somebody this year, but what are you trying to accomplish when you disciple them? What's your goal? Well, what's God's goal? It's to get us to look like his son. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said to the Galatian believers in chapter 4, verse 19. My little children, of whom I travail and birth again until Christ be formed in you. Wow. Paul was taking responsibility for a younger Christian calling them his children. You have a responsibility to get a younger Christian and to mentor them. But as you mentor them, 
you're going to find out it's hard work. Some are not as diligent as others. And that's why there's pain involved until Christ is formed in them. The life, the thinking, the values of Christ, his meekness, the fruit of the Spirit, his love, his joy. And then we looked at last week, Romans chapter 8, verse 29, for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And then the uh, last point underneath uh, point number two is this, Christ is our life. Don't you hate your old nature? And don't you desire to live a different way? That's a God-given desire. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 says, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. That's God's goal for you, to save you in every area. Not to leave you hopeless in a besetting sin. God's goal is to be your life and to save you to the uttermost. And then it, notice this, it says, seeing that he ever lives to make intercession for them. Oh, I'm so glad Jesus prays for me. I'm glad that you pray for me. I'm glad that my wife prays for me, that my father prays for me. But I'm so glad that Jesus prays for me because he really knows how to pray for me. And he ever lives to do that. So he is my life. So as we go through the death of the cross, we come to appreciate that Christ is our life. We come to appreciate that death leads to life. 2 Corinthians 4, 11, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Paul told the Philippians, For me to live is Christ. Christ is our life. I trust that 2021, for you to live this next year, I trust that it'll be about Christ. Life isn't about you. It's about Christ. For me to live is Christ. Then we will realize so much that as Christ went to the cross, so we go to the cross. And that pain of dying and conforming to Christ can be comforted then through the Holy Spirit, which leads us to our third point. Be a um, reckoning Christian that reckons as a spirit-centered Christian. He is our promised comforter. He's our comforter. Uh, Jesus told his disciples, hey, I'm going to leave and I'm going to go back to my father. And they're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. No, you can't. You can't go. Uh, listen, you know the way. Well, show us the Father and it, it would suffice us. Have you been with me and you've not seen the Father? I tell you, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes into the Father but through me. And so as he was leaving, he says this to his disciples, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. This is the distinguishing characteristic of the time in which we live. The Holy Spirit of God abides with us forever. He lives with us. In the old dispensation, he came upon Christians. In this time period, he lives in us and he stays with us forever. In the old dispensation, he would come upon somebody and then he would leave. But in this dispensation, he lives and abides in us forever. John 14, 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost... Whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring them into your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So you see where this is going? It's kind of a loop, isn't it? A word-centered Christian, a Christ or a cross-centered Christian, a spirit-centered Christian, but what does the spirit do? Leads us back to the words of Jesus. And we must walk in the spirit and then we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. But he's our comforter. When we realize how much dying we have to do as an individual, then we'll appreciate the fact that he's the comforter that helps us understand that death to self leads to life in Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18 
but we with all as an open face beholding as a glass darkly, the, I'm sorry, as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What do you need to give to the Lord this year in an area of conformity to Christ? Identify it. Then how do you go about that? Well, you follow the Holy Spirit. He'll guide you into Christ and his cross and his resurrection. Paul said to the Philippians that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. But then he'll also guide you back into the word. And so if you're going to overcome that besetting sin this year, you've got to be in the word. You've got to know what the spirit says about it. You have to reckon yourself to be dead to that besetting sin and alive unto God. You have to live by faith in that regard. And as you get into the Word of God and the Holy Spirit changes you, the Word of God is like beholding the face of God. It is the mind of God. And it's revealing to us what we need to be. You know, the beautiful thing about the Holy Spirit is that He bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So as you struggle with that besetting sin, don't think that you're not saved. That's not going to help you. Know that you're saved because the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. And then if you're a child of God, then you have faith and you are an overcomer through your faith. And so the Holy Spirit then not only is our comforter, he's our witness. And uh, so you see that there on letter B. And uh, he witnesses to Christ's death. He comforts and convicts, but the Holy Spirit never condemns. And I was just talking about that just a second ago, about don't think that you're not saved. Let me share with you the difference here between conviction and condemnation. The Holy Spirit never condemns. That's the work of the devil. But the Holy Spirit does convict. Let's talk about this for just a second. The definition of a conviction is a strong persuasion or belief, the state of being convinced, the act of convincing a person of error or of compelling admission of the truth, the state of being convinced of error or compelled to admit the truth. That's what the Holy Spirit will do. He'll lead you back into all things whatsoever I've commanded you, Jesus said. He'll convince you of the truth of God's word and you'll reckon, hey, that's true. That's right. That's what I need to do. That's how I conform. But now listen what the devil will do. He'll condemn to declare to be reprehensible to a judge unfit for use. Oh, I can't live for God. I might as well give up. I just keep failing over and over again. I can't conform. I'll never look like Jesus. I'm not even saved. I, 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 oh man, I am so messed up. Hey, listen, God's grace is greater than your sin. Marvelous, matchless, infinite, wonderful grace of Jesus. And so God, if you'll confess your sin, 1 John 1, 9, God will balance the guilt with the blame. If you accept the blame for your actions, God will remove the guilt. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You know, your fellowship is up to you. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Hey, even in that, uh, when we're not walking in the light and we're walking in sin, guess what the Holy Spirit does? He doesn't come and condemn us. He comes and convicts us and sheds the light and says, you're off the path. Let's get back over to here to intimacy and fellowship with Jesus. Not that you're not saved and you need to get saved over again. No, that's just, that's not stable. Okay? You are the child of God, but walk in the light and you will have fellowship with him. And then he is a witness to the resurrection life of the Lord Jesus. So let's go back to Romans chapter 6. And look at verses 13 and 14.
Neither yield ye your members as instruments of righteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instrument of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. A besetting sin does not have to ruin your life. It does not have to control your life. You're not under that bondage anymore. You're dead to that, and you're alive to God by faith. And so we don't want to yield. Now, this word reckon in verse 11 is powerful. That's what our whole series is about. Consider something to be true. But the next key word in Romans chapter 6 is this word yield. Now, if you drive a car, you know what that means. You should at least know what that means. It means take your foot off the gas, cover the brake, and look, and be ready to stop. It means that you're surrendering the right of way to the person to whom it belongs to. And so as a Christian, you take the foot off of the controls of the gas pedal of life, and you, by grace, cover the brake and say, God, I'm looking for you. You have the right of way. Control my life. And so with your instruments of your body, the members of your body, your hands, your feet, your mouth, your eyes, okay? You know, a humorous thing that I saw on uh, Facebook was that my hands are consuming more alcohol than my mouth. Well, that's definitely true for a pastor. But, you know, that's not always true for other people. And if alcohol is the besetting sin, then don't use your hands to put it to your mouth. Don't use your feet and your hands to go to the convenience store to pick it up. Go a different route. Go a different way. Yield these instruments alive unto God. Replace that with doing something for the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As Christians, we're never without hope. And the quality of hope that we have is a lively hope. And then what is reserved for us? Verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You're secure in your relationship with God. You're kept by His power. Nothing plucks you out of the Father's hand. But you do need to work in your intimacy and your fellowship with the Lord. And then in closing, the Holy Spirit is a witness to the power of the Bible. He points us back to the word, John 16, 13. He will guide you into all truth, whatsoever things I have commanded you. So we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Now, one of my children, I'll not brag on which one specifically, just brag on all my children. But one of them said, I read 50 books this last year. <gasps> How do you do that? All right. Um, maybe 10. Uh, struggle through that, you know. Uh, I'm working through one right now. I'm about 250 pages into it, and it's about a 1,000-page book. Um, it's going to take me a long time. All right. But I'm working my way through it. Well, what's different is the Bible is the living Word of God, and it's going to actually help me. Whereas uh, a piece of history or fiction is not going to have that power because it's not the Word of God. So we're born again by the Word of God which lives and abides forever. And so why we reckon? We must reckon as a Word-centered Christian a Christ or a cross-centered Christian and a spirit-centered Christian. Maybe 2021 is the year in which you'll come to new life in Christ Jesus. You're born again by the Word of God. The Word of God is what creates faith. Isn't this what Romans chapter 10 says? 
Faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? Word of God. It's what creates a local church. Do you want to see God do a work in 2021 here at Calvary? Then proclaim the word because it'll create faith in people as you give it to them. And they'll be born again. And so if this can be the year that you uh, share the gospel and a friend comes to know Jesus. This can be the year that you personally repent and put your trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. By the word of God that tells you you're a sinner, do you reckon that to be true? Because God says so. There's not a just person on the earth that doeth right. For all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. Do you reckon that to be true? Do you reckon the solution for sin to be true? That he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Jesus paid for those sins. Do you also reckon this to be true? That God made Jesus to be sin for you, even though he didn't know sin. That you might become the righteousness of God in him. Reckon that to be true. And then call upon him for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you reckon that it's a true thing that Jesus loves you so much that he died for you, was buried for you and rose again for you? That if you believe on him, that he loves you so much, he'll actually save you if you call on him. If you reckon those things to be true, then you'll be saved. We start out by reckoning the gospel to be true and we continue to grow as a Christian by reckoning the word of God to be true. So be a word-centered, Christ-centered, spirit-centered Christian. I trust that that will encourage you in your walk with the Lord. Let's have our benediction at this time. It's found in Numbers chapter 6, uh, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Let's pray.